Great, thanks so much again, Louis. Uh, so with this, uh, we'll continue our program, and it gives me great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce my very close colleague, uh, Juan Valley from uh, Christie's in Manchester in the UK. Uh, actually, Juan is the vice chair for the medical advisory board that uh, I have the privilege to chair along, and we work very closely together. Uh, and I have to say they have a very well-oiled machine in the Christie's, uh, which I had the pleasure to visit. And uh, uh, really, they've been uh, quite uh, uh, impressive in regard to their ability to regroup patients on clinical trials in the biliary cancer arena in a country of the size of the UK. And uh, definitely uh, Juan will give us uh, some sense about uh, all what's going on with regard to therapy, but I would like also to hear how you guys do it because there's some model in the UK that really we can probably learn from. Uh, so please, uh, Juan Vali, thanks. Thank you very much, Kazan, for the uh, warm introduction. And I'd also uh, like to thank um, uh, Stacy and the whole team at Collins Carcinoma Foundation for uh, the warm invitation to come and, and speak to you. And I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share your day uh, with you. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist, and I've been treating cholangiocarcinoma now for about 16 years. And I think in that time, a lot has changed. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do is give you a sense of what it is and that trials have managed to achieve or where our previous research has brought us. Uh, but one of the changes that I've also seen is uh, a, a complete different engagement from uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So the very early part of my 16 years uh, were spent sending out lots of letters of intent to different companies to try and get somebody to please share your drugs with us so that we can open clinical trials and just start treating patients uh, with cholangiocarcinoma. It's really refreshing to see that there are some people from industry uh, attending the conference, uh, but also we're now seeing clinical trials that are being led by industry and making uh, accessible to us uh, some of the agents that we want to get access to. I'm also grateful to, to see that I've got uh, members of the multidisciplinary team here with me. I won't be able to answer all the questions. I'm very much a medical oncologist, um, but uh, I, I will defer any questions to, to colleagues uh, if, if necessary. So you don't need me to go through this again. Uh, that's been very well covered before uh, in terms of the uh, cholangiocarcinoma. We know that cholangiocarcinoma counts in, in the US uh, for around uh, 6,000 cases. As a medical oncologist, what we tend to also do is treat other cancers of the biliary tree, including gallbladder cancer, uh, uh, as well as um, sometimes uh, ampullary tumors, uh, depending on which, which protocol. They are rare. And so what we do need to do is to collaborate together. It's unlikely that uh, in an individual center we're going to be able to answer the questions. And one of the themes that you'll hear coming through is one very much of, of collaboration in order for us to understand uh, what's going on with these tumors and, and help us with uh, research. The last year has seen a, a, a publication uh, looking at the geographical variation of cholangiocarcinoma here in the US. And the question being tested here was whether the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma heat map would actually be more in keeping with primary liver hepatocellular carcinoma heat map. And in fact, it wasn't. I've not shown you that heat map for hepatocellular carcinoma. But what they were able to show, in fact, that the heat map for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma was actually very similar to that of extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, except that intrahepatic uh, was much more common. And you'll be able to look up yourself uh, on, on the map and, and work out uh, where it is that you come from. Uh, but particularly, we can see uh, also Alaska and Hawaii seem to be uh, high-risk areas. The other thing that's refreshing is that if you look back to um, 1949, there was one paper published, uh, which is accessible on PubMed, for cholangiocarcinoma. As time has gone by, there have been more and more papers published, and you can see this is in, in five-year intervals, uh, more and more publications. So there's a greater scientific interest, certainly, in cholangiocarcinoma. 
In the last bar, you can see that uh, even within the last five years, uh, 536 papers were published in 2011, 900 uh, last year in 2015. And I suspect this is going to continue to increase. So you're going to hear a lot about clinical trials and how we interpret the data. So I think it's important that you get a sense of what it is that we're looking for. It is very difficult to understand the patient from one, so the data from one individual patient. What we have to do is look at groups of patients. And so this is what we do, and I'm going to give you an example looking at uh, cisplatin and gemcitabine data. So we plot patient's progress on something called a Kaplan-Meier curve, and that's what you can see on the left. If you start off at the 100% at the very top left, that is, all patients are fine. And then as something happens, the curve drops down. So sometimes it's that the cancer relapses, sometimes it's that patients unfortunately die. But every time an event happens, that curve then starts dropping down. And you can see that that drops down as a matter of time. So time is running along the bottom. So if you have uh, a healthy population, and nothing's happening to anybody, then you get a flat line going across the top. But of course we know that one of the uh, realities of, of life is that something will happen to us eventually, and then of course the line starts dropping down. And when we're comparing two treatments, what we do is we compare these curves, these Kaplan-Meier curves. And so, if we get a movement to the right, then the treatment is better. Whatever that treatment is, whether it's surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, whatever intervention we're looking at, treatment is better, it moves to the right. If, however, things are looking worse, it'll then shift to the left. And so it's by comparing those patient populations, sometimes uh, only tens, but often hundreds of patients, that we can get a sense of how well the treatment works for the group as a whole. What we can't say is that for one individual, the treatment will work or won't work in that particular model. So I think it's fair to say that research in uh, cholangiocarcinoma has been a challenge. And because cholangiocarcinoma is rare, trials have often been too small to interpret. So we do have some results, but we don't understand what they really mean. And that is because often they lack statistical power. Now let me give you an example of that. If you have two patients, one responds and one doesn't, your response rate will be 50%. If you then treat another eight patients and unfortunately nobody responds, you've still got one patient who responded, but in fact your response rate is now down to 10%. So the bigger your trial, the more accurately you can, you can determine how successful your treatment is. And one of the things that we do as clinicians, we work with the statisticians to try and work out what is the optimal number of patients that we need in order to give us that certainty or give us that answer. What we don't want to do is to do a thousand patient studies when in fact only a hundred would have answered the question that we had in mind. So it is about being very efficient and being very mindful that these are people's lives and we need to be uh, very accountable to that. I think sometimes trials take a long time to complete. And very often that means that the standard of care treatment is changing in the background. So we need to be mindful of how long a trial took to, to complete uh, in order to understand that. And sometimes to make up for the, the, the small patient numbers, clinical trials have tended to mix together different patient populations. So some patients with cholangio, but also some with pancreas, some with esophagus or gastric cancer. And you can see then that the signal that you're getting gets quite mixed and is no longer a pure signal. And we've already heard that, in fact, in terms of a priority, thankfully, this has improved uh, with the uh, engagement of industry. So we all know, and it's been said a number of times, that surgery provides the only chance of long-term cure. But unfortunately, for uh, most cases, it's not possible to do surgery uh, because disease is either too advanced. We also know, in fact, that most patients uh, who develop this disease tend to be elderly. So uh, the average age is 70 to 73, and arguably you might say that's not completely elderly nowadays. Um, Two-thirds of patients are, are over 65. 
But we do know that with increasing age, we do get increasing other medical problems that can then cause uh, problems with our life expectancy. And you've also heard from uh, earlier that uh, you do get um, problems with infection, and these, Im these problems can actually get more as time goes by, particularly if we've had to breach the biliary tree, as you heard earlier. And if we want to know how well the treatment's working, we rely largely on CT scans. But these can often be very difficult cancers to see on CT scans, and many of you will have heard and even had uh, MRI scans or PET scans, because these are all different ways to allow us to evaluate a tumor. The fact that they're difficult to remove by surgery uh, isn't necessarily just a reflection on uh, the quality of our surgeons, rather the complexity of the liver. And one of the questions I often get from my patients is two things. I've heard you can take away a large part of the liver, so why can't that be done? And the second question is, well, the liver regrows, doesn't it? So why can't you take even more away? So let me just give you a, a little bit of a, a, an example, and please forgive me if I get this wrong on the surgical side. I'm very uh, self-conscious that there is a surgeon in the room. <laughs> so, surgery for a medical oncologist. We now have a much better understanding of, of the liver and the fact that it comes in segments, a little like an orange, except that it's not round, but it does come in very discrete segments. We also understand that for each of those segments, there's, there's a particular blood supply that takes the blood in and removes the blood out of that particular segment. And so often, the limitations of surgery relate to where the cancer is in relation to the blood flow. So for example, I've put it there in red, if you get a tumor that is in what we call segments two and three of the liver, then that can actually be relatively straightforward to remove because you've got lots of healthy blood supply running through the middle of the liver to the rest of the liver to allow that to be removed. However, if you happen to get a tumor which is right at the clockwork of the liver, where all the blood vessels are, even a very small tumor is inoperable. So I think it's very important that we don't just uh, say that uh, surgery is something that can or can't be done. It's something that obviously is assessed very carefully uh, through a, a tumor board in order to assess uh, the resectability. And just to quickly answer the question about the, the liver regrowing, uh, a common misconception is that the, if you take away, say, segments two and three, you will grow another segments two and three. That doesn't happen. So if segments two and three are removed, the rest of the liver which is left behind just enlarges a bit to make up for the bit that's missing. So you don't actually regrow the liver in, in the respect of uh, new segments developing. Was I right there? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with surgery, you will see lots of things in, in the literature about surgical series. People, uh, centers will, will, will provide their results. Uh, but can we improve on the results of surgery? And you've already heard um, from, from Lewis Roberts about uh, transplantation. Um, and this is something that uh, has been looked at for selected patients. I'll come back to that in a second. But if we have done surgery, can we then reduce the chances of the cancer coming back with what we call adjuvant therapy? So adjuvant just means following on from, from surgery. So let me take transplantation first. There are some very good reasons why transplantation might be the right way to, way to go. The location of the cancer, which I've told you, is no longer a problem because, in fact, you're removing the whole liver. So it doesn't really matter if you've got some segments uh, that are, are struggling to get a blood supply. You can clear the cancer completely. You're not worried about going to the very edge of where the cancer is and leaving some behind because you don't want to damage a blood vessel. It reduces the risk of any spillage during surgery itself. It also can deal with an unhealthy liver in the background. So you've heard that in some cases it's primary sclerosing chorangitis. This is chronically inflamed and scarred liver that's left behind. And what it allows you to do is to remove that completely. And it doesn't rely on having that 30% of the liver that you need uh, left behind uh, to, to keep you alive after the operation. It's fair to say that the initial results from transplantation were quite disappointing, uh, with a five-year survival of less uh, than 50%. Those have improved, and they've improved with the recent uh, neoadjuvant therapy approaches before transplantation, 
but you need to be aware that treatment is intensive. So variously, uh, patients need to start off with external beam radiotherapy, which may or may not require additional chemotherapy, may or may not require top-up radiation uh, into the liver itself, uh, and then requires uh, a keyhole surgery or a check to make sure that the cancer is still operable and hasn't spread uh, to the lining of the abdomen on the inside before they're going to have a transplantation. And I think when we talk about liver transplant, we also need to think that we are working within uh, constraints. So the data supporting this is for, for patients with very early disease, uh, stage one or two. You heard earlier again about the staging of these uh, types of cancers, uh, hyla, perihyla cholangiocarcinoma. And when they took out the livers, they found, in fact, some patients didn't have cancer at all. Now, that's difficult to know whether there was never a cancer there in the first place because it was difficult to get the, uh, the confirmation from a biopsy, or whether, in fact, that radiotherapy and chemotherapy and everything else that the patient had had had, in fact, led to a complete response such that the cancer had completely disappeared. But we also need to be mindful that if you're on a transplant waiting list, it doesn't mean that necessarily you're going to get a transplant. And unfortunately, there were a number of patients who died on the waiting list. And if you include everybody who you intended to do the transplant on in the published data, in fact, the five-year survival is much lower, around 53%. Now, you'll be aware that liver transplantation is used for primary uh, uh, liver cancer and, and also for patients who have uh, cirrhosis. And they're seeing results, uh, which is a different disease. I completely understand that. But they're seeing uh, five-year survivals in the region of 85, uh, 90%. So we do need to think, is this the best way forward, uh, particularly when the availability of donors is very limited? So I'm aware that I'm meant to be talking about research, and it's important to see that there are a number of studies now that are evaluating the transplantation approach prospectively. And it's also good to see that these are uh, running across different studies, including the US, but also Italy, China, and France. So the next question is, can we stop the cancer from coming back by using adjuvant treatment. And I don't know how many people in the audience uh, had some adjuvant treatment following uh, surgery. Depending on which type of cancer, that can either include radiotherapy or chemotherapy. We know for breast cancer, for example, it also includes hormone therapy. But I want to just be very clear, what do we mean by adjuvant therapy and what do we mean by it as a treatment for an individual? because even my surgical colleagues very often think this patient needs to have adjuvant treatment with the implication that with the adjuvant treatment there is then a 100% chance that the cancer won't come back. So let me just tell you what happens after adjuvant treatment. We know unfortunately the cancer comes back for some patients. <coughs> and so in that case the disease has relapsed. They probably would have relapsed anyway and unfortunately, those patients did not benefit from the adjuvant chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Some patients are cured. Obviously, everyone hopes that that's going to be them. But they may have been cured anyway. So in fact, the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy did not help, did not benefit those patients. It is for the middle group that we give adjuvant therapy. So these are patients who would have relapsed but because of the treatment that we have given, the adjuvant chemotherapy or the radiotherapy, they have been turned from somebody who would have relapsed to somebody who is cured. Those are the patients who benefit from treatment. Now, the difficulty is we can't tell ahead of time who those patients are. But let me just put that into context by using an example from uh, colorectal cancer. Sorry, the other thing to just quickly add is that very often when you see results from trials from individual centers, um, if they're not randomized, they will be able to tell you how many patients were cured. They will be able to tell you how many patients relapsed. What they won't be able to tell you is that middle group, how many would have relapsed and were cured as a result of your treatment. You only know that by having results of randomized trials. So let's just look at colorectal cancer as an example. If you 
don't give adjuvant chemotherapy for a certain stage of bowel cancer, there's a 50% chance of, of patients are going to be cured and a 50% chance who relapse. Let's just use that for argument's sake, okay? If you give your adjuvant treatment, the 50% who are going to be cured anyway remain cured. And in fact, that 50% at the bottom who were going to relapse, about 10 of those become cured who would have otherwise relapsed. So in fact, the benefit of your adjuvant treatment was for 10% of people. So that means 90 people had the chemotherapy, or radiotherapy for colon cancer, for no benefit to find that 10% of people who did benefit. And in general in oncology, we think 5% is a good enough gain to treat everybody or at least have a discussion and offering chemotherapy. The difficulty we have with cholangiocarcinoma is we don't know how big that group is because the randomized clinical trials haven't yet been performed. So is it 1%, is it 10%, is it 20%? And is it different if you have an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma or you have an extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? But there is some hope because the trials are coming and in fact they have been done. There are two large studies which have now completed. Uh, the Bill Cap study in the UK has recruited, in fact, more than 360 patients. And in that study, half of the patients had surgery alone, half had surgery followed by chemotherapy with oral capecitabine. And then the Prodige 12 study in France used a very similar design. Half of the patients had surgery alone, half had chemotherapy with gemcitabine and oxaliplatin. And both of these studies are just about ready to report. They may well report uh, later this year. And then we will be able to understand that degree of benefit, and maybe who, uh, who, who actually gets the benefit out of all the patients. The last study at the bottom is the one using cisplatin and gemcitabine. That's uh, open and running, um, but in fact is quite a long way off recruiting. It's only recently opened. So uh, the Actica study, which started in Germany, in fact we're now taking part in the UK, is currently comparing surgery alone uh, in half the patients, surgery with cisplatin and gemcitabine in the other half of the patients, although depending on what happens with the other trials, that design may well need to change. So what's new in radiotherapy? Um, one of the difficulties with radiotherapy is that it is an evolving technology. So we started off and we've gone many years from external beam radiotherapy, then we add in chemotherapy because we know chemotherapy can make cells more sensitive to the effects of radiation. So we use it as a combined modality treatment. Then conformal radiotherapy, image modulated radiotherapy. And I guess the most recent ones uh, on, on the block are stereotactic body radiotherapy, radioembolization, and proton beam therapy. And these are, the, these are the modalities that patients are more often asking about. So I'm going to focus on the last three. But what is, is it that we as clinicians want to see? We want to see that we can give higher doses because you're going to get a better response to your treatment. We want to be able to target the tumor more accurately, but we also want to do so by reducing side effects and complications. We want to make sure this treatment is as safe as possible and overall have better outcomes. This is a very busy table. You won't be able to see the detail, but what I included it just because I want you to see what it is that we look for when we're looking at radiotherapy studies. And it's really just the very top row. N, how big is the trial? How many patients were included? Because again, a study with three patients is very difficult to understand. Something, uh, a study that's got uh, 32, 34 patients at the bottom is, is more meaningful in terms of results. So how big is the trial? Localization, where was the tumor? Was this just in patients with intrahepatic cholangios? Was it patients who had both? Was it patients who had uh, gallbladder cancer? This particular one is in fact for intrahepatic cholangio and hylocholangio. Next along the top row is the total dose. How much could actually be delivered? Because that's one of the things that's always been limiting in radiotherapy is not so much the treatment to the tumor, but it's the healthy tissue that obviously gets damaged around the tumor. So how much treatment can we actually deliver in how many fractions, how many visits, how many days? Was chemotherapy added or not? 
because that will change how effective the treatment is. Did you get local control? What's the survival? And the one I've highlighted is the median overall survival. This is the average survival. And this is what we then use to compare how well one treatment uh, or one center is against another. And the final one is important looking, of course, at toxicity. In the UK, in fact, um, we are now doing the ABC07 study. And what this is looking at is uh, starting off all patients with um, uh, chemotherapy, cisplatin and gemcitabine chemotherapy, for an initial three-month period of time. Because we know that that gives us the best chance of controlling all of the disease. Uh, but it also buys us a little bit of time that if somebody has stable disease or responding disease, we can then um, randomly allocate them into one of two groups. Half of the patients carry on with the chemotherapy, and we would consider that our standard of care. The other half of the patients uh, go on to have the uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy to see if we can get as much control as we can. And this is for patients where the tumors are no larger than six centimeters. That's quite big, but we've got to put a cutoff size in. So the other question I'm often asked is, what about proton beam? Uh, and the reason I'm asked that is because, in fact, in, in the UK, uh, there aren't that many proton beam centers, and we're one of the, the proton beam centers. And in fact, although we're not doing it yet, it's being built at our institution. So patients are often asking, you know, can I have proton beam? Uh, and the other thing in the UK is there's been a lot of press around a small uh, boy who uh, was taken away from the UK to have proton beam therapy um, uh, elsewhere in, in Europe. And that, again, flagged a lot of enthusiasm and people wanting to know uh, about proton beams. As I've written there, the, the problem with x-rays is that you get not just the energy delivered where the tumor is, but then as the ray disperses, you also get more energy deposited. And in fact, that's what gives you unwanted radiation exposure and causes some of the uh, side effects and, and uh, toxicities from the radiation. What protons are is that they are positively uh, charged particles. They're given additional energy uh, in a synchrotron or cyclotron. Uh, and then, in fact, once they deposit their energy, they don't have that exit dose. So that can allow you to limit uh, some of the, um, the toxicity. And in fact, it has been uh, looked at already uh, in uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So uh, this is the team uh, who are, in fact, here tomorrow. So you'll be able to ask them uh, questions if you're interested. This was a single arm phase two study looking at primary liver tumors that included intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, but also hepatocellular carcinoma. There were uh, 39 patients with uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. They needed to be fit. Uh, no evidence of the disease spreading outside of the liver, no prior radiation. And if you just look at the results in yellow, those are the ones for the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The ones in blue are for the primary liver, the hepatocellular carcinoma. What the team were able to do was to deliver the proton treatment in 15 different fractions. They were able to give a high dose of uh, radiation. Um, and in fact, again, the average size of the tumor that they treated was six centimeters, although you can see they went up to 11 centimeters, which is quite a big tumor. And what they were able to show, the OS there means median overall survival, the average overall survival of 22 and a half months. Now we know that with chemotherapy, this is about a year. So it looks like potentially they might be able to push uh, the overall survival out um, to nearly uh, two years uh, by using proton beam therapy. And again, this is a busy slide, but I just want you to concentrate on the box that's highlighted. So when we look at side effects, again, we grade them. Grade one and two side effects are ones that are relatively mild. They don't really affect your activities of daily living. When we get to grade three and four side effects, these are much more serious uh, side effects uh, which have uh, impact on quality of life and are potentially life-threatening. And in fact, what the study w was able to show is that there was a quite a low number of grade three and there were no four side effects. So in terms of how well this was tolerated, it was a much better tolerated treatment, which is what they assumed in the first place. 
And again, so where is this leading us? In fact, there is a study following on, uh, which is looking at cisplatin and gemcitabine chemotherapy, again for an induction period, uh, and then uh, using um, a randomized design where some patients carry on with chemotherapy alone, and the other half of the patients go on to have proton treatment. So very similar to the SBRT uh, approach. So within these randomized trials, then we actually do get to find out what's the extra value that uh, the proton beam or the SBRT add, if at all. And there's always an assumption that clinical trials are always going to be positive, but in fact there have been a number of studies which show actually there isn't benefit. And I think those studies are equally important because they allow us then to focus on a different area or maybe to answer specific questions arising from that. In the UK, we have uh, 10 centers uh, which are approved to give um, selective intra-arterial radiotherapy, uh, or CERT. I don't know how familiar you are with these, but the concept behind these is that rather than giving radiation from the outside as a beam, or in fact multiple beams, this is about delivering radiation which is loaded onto small beads. So these beads are actually so small that you can give them as an injection, um, there's a procedure where, through the groin, a, a small catheter is, is uh, threaded up towards the liver, and then it allows you to deliver the radioactive beads, uh, and then the beads then get stuck in the areas of the tumor, deliver high doses of radiation, uh, but in fact, um, the liver uh, itself is then uh, able to survive. And in fact, there have been already a number of studies looking at this in cholangiocarcinoma, and what they've shown is that um, it can allow the tumors to shrink, and the tumors were in fact able to shrink in around uh, nearly 30% of the time. The average survival was around 15 and a half months. Again, this is something that's in evolution, and there were some side effects that we are increasingly aware of. Uh, as in any radiation, tiredness tends to be a problem, fatigue, together with abdominal pain, uh, fever, nausea, uh, abnormal uh, liver tests, and in fact, out of all the patients who were treated, uh, and there were 298 patients, there was one treatment-related death. Uh, so we need to be aware that these are treatments that are associated with, uh, with side effects. One of the things that we've really learned over the past few years is how to do this treatment much more safely. There's always a risk that you give enough radiation that then turns the liver uh, in, into uh, an inflammatory process and you get something called radiation-induced liver damage. I think the, the, uh, the important thing is that you give just enough radiation to treat the tumor, not enough to allow the liver to fail. And in fact, there's a much better understanding now on how to prevent that and treat that. And out of all of the studies, there is in fact no randomized phase three trial. So again, how much extra benefit does it add? Uh, we don't know. But we do know that this is a treatment because the beads only sit inside the liver. It is only a treatment for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And it depends where it is, how much it is, how good the backup bl blood supply is uh, to the liver. So again, there is a, a randomized phase two trial that's going to be done, and uh, that's going to be comparing, uh, again, starting off with uh, standard chemotherapy in one arm, and the other arm uh, randomly starts off with um, the radioactive beads and then goes on to have chemotherapy. So some patients start off with chemo alone, the other half start off with the radiation beads and then go on to chemotherapy, and then we'll really get to understand how much these radioactive beads add uh, over and above uh, the chemotherapy alone. What's new in chemotherapy? I think regretfully there have been no practice changing first-line treatments uh, since 2010. Um, just to quickly recap, we know, and you've already heard, that this is a devastating disease. If we don't do anything uh, in terms of best supportive care alone, uh, the average survival is very short in the region of two and a half to four and a half months. We know that with combination chemotherapy with cisplatin and gemcitabine, on average patients will survive about a year. That is still not good enough, it's still modest. But it allows us to be able to build on that. We now have a single standard of care on which we can add some of the new uh, treatments that we have uh, available, or at least the treatments that we want to explore. One of the things that we have learned over the past year 
is that in fact we may be able to treat more patients than we thought previously. So because it was done as part of a tight clinical trial, our patients had to have, you've heard about bilirubin, and if bilirubin goes high, you get jaundice, the yellowing, yellowest of the eyes and, and the skin. Um, in fact, when we set the trial parameters, patients were not allowed to be jaundiced before they went into the trial. But we know, in fact, that jaundice is a reality of this disease. And so what we were able to do is to have a look at 33 patients where we had been able to treat them because they were well enough even though they were jaundiced. And in fact, what we found is that in patients where they were already jaundiced, and in fact we know that once that has set in, that can become life-threatening quite quickly, and we're talking about within three or four weeks. Uh, in fact, if you were able to treat and patients were fit enough, they were able to live close to 10 months by using the cisplatin and gemcitabine combination. But that only applied if you had a tumor that was blocking off the bile ducts because you could then get an improvement and the bile ducts drained better. Where it didn't work was where the liver was very badly damaged already. Uh, by the bottom scan, you can see all the dark areas are different areas of tumor. And here, the, the reason somebody's jaundice is because, in fact, the liver is failing because of the amount of disease in, in, in the liver. So we now know we can treat some extra patients provided uh, they are fit enough. There are some chemotherapy combinations that we need to keep an eye out. Uh, we know that combination is better than one drug. Uh, we know that there are some other doublets that we are tracking. And in fact, there are some triple combination chemotherapies uh, that are now being tested. Um, uh, you can see the combination of five of you irinotecan, oxaliplatin, otherwise known as fulfirinox, which is something we use for pancreatic cancer, is being looked at uh, in Chicago. Gemcitabine, cisplatin with 5-FU, so a triplet combination there in Ann Arbor. And gemcitabine, cisplatin, and S1, this is a drug that's available in Japan, similar to 5-FU, again a triple combination. So does triple chemotherapy give us better uh, results than double chemotherapy? We will find that out in, in time. Are there any new drugs, new drugs that might work better than, than, than some of the drugs that we've been using previously? So there's a, a drug called acelerin that we're interested in at the moment. Uh, this is very similar to gemcitabine, but not the same. Gemcitabine needs a porter to get it into the cell from the bloodstream. Uh, so we call that a transporter. It needs to be transported by uh, something called HENT1. It's a protein on the surface of the cell, and that allows the gemcitabine to get into the cell. Acelerin doesn't need that porter. It goes straight into the cell. The other advantage is that gemcitabine, when it's broken down, produces a number of different compounds, and a lot of those compounds account for some of the side effects. So we don't get that with acelerin. So what we'd like to work out is whether we can replace gemcitabine with acelerin. It has already gone through uh, some early tests, um, and in fact this is uh, a phase one study where acelerin was used on its own, and you can see each one of the blue bars accounts for one patient, and there have been four patients with cholangiocarcinoma who have been included. Three out of the four patients uh, had stable disease, so it stopped the cancer getting worse. And remember, this is in the setting where the cancer was already getting worse on their standard chemotherapy, and for one patient it didn't work. These numbers are too small, but it gives you a hint that this may be something that's useful in cholangiocarcinoma. And the uh, ABC08 study uh, is in fact a phase one study where we're now combining uh, acelerin in combination with uh, cisplatin. We want to find out what's the right dose of acelerin to use in combination with cisplatin so that in fact then it can go on to a randomized trial which is going to be led uh, by the team at Princess Margaret in Toronto. I'm pleased to say that the first patient went into this trial yesterday uh, and so far so good. That's, that's how hot of the press it is. <laughs> we know that the cancer then very often does get worse after first-line chemotherapy. And uh, the question then we have from patients is, now what are you going to do? Uh, and the difficulty is that we don't really have very good backup op options. So in terms of second-line chemotherapy, 
our team looked at all of the trials of all of the treatments to try and get a sense of how effective they were. We found quite a few studies. There were 14 phase two studies with 416 patients who had participated. We found nine retrospe retrospective studies with another 400 patients. And in adding those up, you can see there's around uh, 800, close to 900 patients who had all received treatment within various studies of second line uh, treatments. And you can also see a very long list of different options. It's disappointing to see that we weren't able to come up with a conclusion regarding the best approach. The only thing we could say is patients want new treatments. Patients want to be involved in clinical trials, and we could see that, that nearly 900 of patients had. And maybe what we should be doing as a community is coordinating that better so that we can get better answers of what is effective uh, on and second-line treatment. One of the things that we found in terms of results, if you pull them all together, and it's very difficult to interpret these results when you do put them all together, is in fact the amount of time that the chemotherapy controlled the cancer was probably only until the first scan. So really these were not very effective treatments, uh, and unfortunately I think we need to do better in second line. And one of the things that we're asking in the UK in the ABC06 study is actually is chemotherapy the right thing to do at the moment? And you'll hear lots of things in, in the next talk about uh, new trials and new exciting targets that we may, may be able to uh, address. But at the moment in 2016, what we know and what we've heard is that very often patients run into problems with infections, a recurrent infection, problems with needing a stent and a second stent. And we do need to work out when the right time is to stop doing uh, all of these stents. And in the ABC06 study, in fact, half of the patients have what we call active symptom control. That means very close monitoring. We're not just leaving things to chance. We're looking out to see where uh, these infections are very early on. We're treating them aggressively uh, with antibiotics, maybe sorting out uh, any blocked uh, stents or drains, uh, and uh, then uh, managing patients uh, with the comfort care that you heard about uh, earlier on. The other half of the patients are having chemotherapy as well as all of that, and this is with oxaliplatin and 5-AFU. And one of the uh, things that we want to find out is actually how effective chemotherapy is in a well-studied prospective randomized phase three trial. And to date, uh, we're nearly halfway there. 75 patients have been recruited out of 162 patients. But I think one of the things that's really changed, uh, and you'll hear more about this in the next talk and then uh, again tomorrow, is our understanding of the uh, biology uh, of, of these various, uh, various cancers. We know now that broadly uh, there are a number of pathways uh, that make a cancer uh, develop, grow, and spread. And you'll be pleased to hear, I'm not gonna go through all of those pathways in any great detail. What I want to do, though, is highlight a couple of things. There have already been some studies, in fact, four studies, that have looked at one particular pathway. This is the EGFR pathway, or the epithelial growth factor receptor pathway. So this is a pathway whereby you take signals from the cell surface, uh, and then it passes messages down into the cell to make the cell then divide. And this is a pathway that, in fact, is quite common in a number of cancers. Uh, and where this particular treatment has worked very well is in bowel cancer, in colorectal cancer. There was a very exciting very first study, which I've not included here, that suggested that by adding in a monoclonal antibody to block the signal on the surface, you might really improve the effect of chemotherapy. And in fact, there was a lot of excitement, and it's really on the basis of that one study that these four other randomized studies uh, were performed. There's two different types of drugs. There's a monoclonal antibody, and that includes cetuximab and panitumumab. These names get more and more difficult as time goes by. Um, but there was also uh, erlotinib, which you may have heard about. This is a, an oral treatment that then blocks the signal once it's in the cell. Unfortunately, all of those four studies were negative. 
And I think this really highlights the importance of doing the randomized studies. You can get a very exciting early look on a phase two study where you've got a small cohort of patients, you think you've got a very exciting signal. Uh, I think it's still important for us to, um, to take um, patients through a randomized study so that we really understand, is there a benefit? And if there isn't a benefit for everybody altogether, are there maybe some patients, even 10% of patients, who might really get a lot of benefit? And what is it about those patients that's different? The other thing that uh, was presented just last year by uh, me and the rest of the team uh, was a negative study looking at sidirinib. And sidirinib is um, one of the, the treatments that reduces angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the development of new blood vessels. So as a cancer grows, it becomes starved of its oxygen supply. It then produces factors that allow the cancer to throw out very tiny little roots. And those little roots are new blood vessels. And what we can do is actually block the development of those new blood vessels. And this is a treatment that has been successful in other cancers. So far, it's not been successful in cholangiocarcinoma. But one of the problems that we hit is that, in fact, adding sidirinib to standard chemotherapy added more side effects. So maybe we should be looking at a different compound that has less side effects if we want to see the benefit. You've also heard from uh, Lewis that um, we are gradually increasing our understanding of the fact that um, Although we're using these terms, in fact, we might be dealing with different diseases who have uh, different um, molecular, molecular signatures. And you can see there in, in the table that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has a different profile to extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Um, sorry, I don't have a pointer, but uh, I think some of these uh, are important. Uh, if you look at extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, KRAS substitutions, you can see that 42% is actually much higher than you see in other cancers. So is there something about these different patterns that will allow us to be able to treat patients differently? And I think you'll hear more about this in, in the next presentation. You also heard some questions about uh, the, the, the parasite or, or the liver fluke associated uh, cancer. And in fact, you'll hear again tomorrow that even in the same country, the cholangiocarcinoma that arises from the liver fluke infestation is different to the cholangiocarcinoma that arises in a non-infected patient. So there is something different that's driving the cholangiocarcinoma to develop. And our understanding of that may well allow us a uh, different treatment strategy. And we may also now be subdividing patients into different groups uh, in terms of an inflammatory subclass or a proliferative subclass. At this stage, none of this is going to change what we're actually doing in the clinic today and tomorrow, but it's certainly a direction of travel. And with the work that uh, Lewis and his team are doing, understanding much better uh, what's going on in the genetics of this disease, uh, as well as other groups, I think the future looks bright in terms of new treatments. Because we now have uh, treatments for very specific mutations. And again, I'm not going to go through this in any greater detail, because this will be covered uh, by the next presentation. But just to pause for thought, we do have a number of challenges ahead. And my question would be, what mutation? If you think about uh, this liver, and this is a very elegant uh, cartoon, um, if you start off in the primary tumor, which is uh, at the top left, and that takes you um, up into uh, the, the top right in terms of the, um, the, the round figure, you can see um, that you've got red, green, light green, and blue but they're all different clones of cells. And as time goes by, you actually get different areas within the liver that have different uh, cells, different clones that are driving. And in fact, you may find that spread into the lungs has different clones again. So when we're thinking about taking a biopsy, is which biopsy of which tumor at which time point and which is the right mutation? And is this the mutation that's actually driving uh, and needs uh, some treatment? So I think it, it's, it's, it's going to be very challenging for us. And I would absolutely agree with the previous discussion that, in fact, if things are changing, we may well need to ask for another biopsy. 
because it may really help us to understand the disease much better. And just in the last couple of minutes, identifying the gaps, what I want you to think about is the whole spectrum of patients who are starting off with uh, very early disease through to advanced disease. And I think it's fair that we need to improve treatments for our first-line therapy, we need to improve treatments for second-line therapy, and for selected patients, we may also be able to use new types of radiation therapy, whether it's SBRT, proton ready therapy, sorry, proton therapy, or uh, CERT. But I think, to date, surgery remains uh, the only chance of getting rid of this completely. We need to understand better uh, what the impact is of adjuvant treatment, and in fact, more importantly, can we use neoadjuvant treatment in patients who have a borderline resectable tumor, so it's not possible to do an operation straight away, but if we can shrink it, get it away from the blood vessels, is it then possible uh, to undertake surgery? But I think increasingly we also need to think about prevention, screening, early detection, because in fact this is where we're likely to make the, b the greatest impact on survival. I know I've not talked about gallbladder cancer at all today, but one of the biliary cancers is gallbladder cancer. This is very, very common in, in Chile. But when you look at the population in Chile, the people who are getting gallbladder cancer, which is now the commonest cause of cancer death in women, more, more lethal than breast cancer, it's the people in the lower socioeconomic classes that get gallbladder cancer. It's something to do with the environment rather than the country and the genetics. So we need to be thinking, are there ways that we can prevent this uh, by changing the environment the patients are living within? And just to give you uh, an example of that, there are a number of risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma, and it depends which paper you look at. You'll always get a slightly different list. Uh, there are some here that are general. We know that cancer gets more common as we get older, so age over 65 is not, uh, not a great surprise. It is associated with obesity and diabetes. You've already heard about a number of uh, inflammatory diseases that predispose, uh, which we may or may not be able to do anything about. Congenital abnormalities you heard about right at the beginning. The way you're born, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, infectious diseases, you've heard about liver flukes. We also know that cholangiocarcinoma is more common uh, in hepatitis B and C infected patients. And there's a, there's a list of drugs, toxins, or chemicals. But I think where this is important is that there are a number of these we might be able to do something about. So in terms of reducing uh, the uh, incidence of cholangiocarcinoma in time, uh, it may be that we also need to focus on some of these preventive measures. And just to finally say that a lot of this progress has come through uh, collaboration. Uh, within the UK, the way that we've uh, collaborated is through the National Cancer Research Institute. We have the uh, hepatobiliary subgroup. Uh, and in fact, on the top right, you can see members of that. Uh, and include Helen Mormont, who's in the audience uh, and is chair of the uh, AMMF cholangiocarcinoma charity in the UK. In fact, we also now have a collaboration which is uh, global, and we meet at uh, ASCO every year, and you can see that that includes a, a very good representation from uh, the U.S. together with uh, the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. And you've also heard about the uh, International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network, uh, which is something, again, uh, largely driv driven by the, the foundation, uh, aiming at improving uh, the outcomes of patients with cholangiocarcinoma. So to wrap up, maybe prevention is going to be better than cure in the long term. So we need to improve awareness, we need to understand the risk factors, and we need to move towards early detection if possible. Involvement of the multidisciplinary team, you've heard this more than once, is essential to provide the best patient care. We need to keep on improving the tools we currently have available. Surgery, endoscopy, intervention radiology, radiation oncology, as an oncologist, I am fully aware that we need to develop more effective systemic therapies, but we also need to apply the new and emerging genomic technology uh, and continue to innovate uh, through collaboration. I'd like to thank in particular all of the patients who have participated in the clinical trials as well, as well as the caregivers and their supporters, researchers and their teams, as well as the, uh, the charities, and just to highlight the World Cholangiocarcinoma Day is not far away. Thank you very much.
Hi, everyone. My name is Nina, and I'm an addict. <laughs> oh, wrong meeting. <laughs> well, my drug of choice is cisplatin and Gemsar. And um, obviously, I'm a patient. Uh, I'm sorry if you covered this, but um, I don't speak the medical language, and I'm trying to still learn English. Um, but it's my understanding that the immunotherapy has been approved in the UK for some time now. Actually, my sister traveled from Norway to the UK to receive treatment. And uh, I'm just curious, is it approved for Colandrio, and what, are, um, what is its success rate? Okay, so immunotherapy is very topical at the moment and new. Um, it is approved in the UK, but not for cholangiocarcinoma. So, as you know, when uh, different approvals come through for different drugs, you need to rely on the evidence. The evidence is scrutinized by the regulating authorities, who then give approval depending on the strength of that data. There has been some uh, early data presented um, on the Keynote 28 study. This is a study that looked at pembrolizumab. And within their umbrella uh, study, um, there were a number of patients with uh, cholangiocarcinoma. There was about 89 patients from memory that were included. And they were looking for patients who uh, had pdl one positivity. So in other words, this is the target for pembrolizumab. Uh, PDL1 is, is, is the cloak, as it were, um, that, that hides the cancer cells from the immune system. So if you can deal with that cloak, you then expose the cancer cells to the immune system and it can work. Out of, out of uh, in fact, the 24 patients who were treated with pembrolizumab, four had a response, four had stable disease. These numbers are very, very small. So what we can't do at the moment is to say that that is practice changing. But it's interesting enough for us to want to think about doing clinical trials, and in fact, some of those are already being planned. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, so tomorrow, Dr. Kane's colleagues from uh, Norway will be talking also with the press about this drug, even though we, we heard a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to steal the thunder. <laughs> Okay, um, I did the gemcitabine cisplatin regimen and was introduced to Tarceva, in which I had a, a great response. I'm actually a liver transplant recipient and four years cancer-free since the transplant. Um, how come, what's, what's your uh, position on Tarceva and, and why it wasn't one of the listed chemotherapies? Thank you for your question. Um, so in the UK, we have to use the generic names rather than the trade names. So, uh, so it was there, it's called erlotinib. Um, so we overall, in the randomized study, it didn't provide a benefit. Um, but as you're a testament, <laughs> there are some patients who do benefit. And I think this is where we have the challenge. How can we identify the patients who are going to benefit? And more importantly, how can we identify this ahead of the event rather than after it's happened? Uh, and, and that would really allow us then to be able to, to tailor the treatment for individuals. Hi, I'm, oops, I'm Jeff Shuckman. I'm a patient, I guess, or a customer. <laughs> uh, according to the pharmaceutical companies, are you working with far? Are you with the pharmaceutical company? No, nope. so I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I don't trust. Them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do. I do have a question now. You were talking about a celerant. Is that an attempt to just slow down the progression, or is that an attempt in a cure? So I think it's fair to say that any chemotherapy options at the moment are about slowing down progression. Um, we may get shrinkage. Um, but it, we've not yet seen complete cures, by, by which we mean you know, complete eradication of the cancer. It doesn't come back with at least five years' test of time. Okay. Well, one thing that I worry about, they say, well, the only way to get cured is with surgery. If it comes back 76% of the time worse, is it really better to have the surgery or try to keep the dead in your liver? From growing. That's a very good question, and maybe uh, I can involve the multidisciplinary team okay. here. But one more quick question, I'll okay. sit down. I did read a study from 2010 uh, from Thailand that seems like all the information's been blocked, where they used uh, cisplatin and gemsar, which I've used successfully, uh, and then they added uh, Marinol THC to it, and they achieved uh, cell death with that. And I've tried to get research, and I've asked doctors about it, 
and I don't know if they're getting blocked from the information or I've misread it and it wasn't effective, but everything I read about it shows that it is effective. And I don't, can you get me more information about this study? And it's not what I'm familiar with, <laughs> so maybe it's been blocked from me. No. It, it um, is on PubMed. It is on PubMed. Yeah. It was a clinical trial. So, so I, th I think it's fair to say that um, most trials will at some point then be published. We are, uh, our ear is close to the ground. So Gassan and, uh, and I will attend the major conferences. Our ear is close to the ground. You know what's coming over the horizon in terms of active treatments. It's not something that's, uh, that, that, that's been rumbling loud enough uh, to come through as a, as a new active treatment. Well, it just seems to me that there are pharmaceuticals just out to keep you going instead of cure. And it doesn't seem like they're trying for a cure for this cancer uh, other than surgical and immunotherapy trials. So I, if I can just pick up on that, I, th I think it's a very important point you make. What we know that the chemotherapy will have an effect on a certain proportion of cells at any given time. And so this is one of the reasons why we're having to keep giving chemotherapy in different schedules and different cycles, because at any given time, you'll have a different percentage of cells that are dividing and are affected by the chemotherapy. So even if, for example, you had 90% uh, or 99% of cells uh, you've still got 1% of cells that might be quiet. They're not dividing at the time. Chemotherapy washes right over them, so it won't have any effect. So at any given time, you're always going to have that sanctuary, as it were, for cells not to be uh, affected by the chemotherapy. The li limitations of chemotherapy for solid tumors, so we know that in leukemias, if you use a high, dose, high enough dose of chemotherapy and radiation, you can completely ablate uh, the, the disease. We know that for certain types of solid tumors, testicular cancer being a very good example, it's exquisitively sensitive to chemotherapy, and you can get cures even in advanced disease. There's another rare type of cancer, choriocarcinoma, um, which uh, is, is different to cholangiocarcinoma. It sounds the same, but it's not. Um, but that is, uh, again, very sensitive to chemotherapy and can be cured. Unfortunately, with any solid tumors, whether it's lung and bowel cancer, and unfortunately includes cholangiocarcinoma, um, the chemotherapy can only do so much. And I can hand on heart say it's not that we're holding treatments away, it's not that we want to keep spinning this out. Nobody would want to get uh, a, a cure for cancer more than and any of us as a community. Um, I think it's just a limitation of, of solid tumor responses to chemotherapy. Great. Uh, let's hear from uh, Dr. Rocha. Hi, just to um, follow up on the, on the first question, um, and I'd like to actually congratulate Juan on an excellent review, and, and his command of the liver anatomy is the best I've seen from a medical oncologist. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your question very, is very, very pertinent. Um, you know, we as surgeons, we, we have a blunt tool. Um, that's a knife, a scalpel, you know, all those other toys that we use to cut, to cut things out of the, out of the liver. Um, and I can only see what I can see through my eyes and through my glasses. I can't see the microscopic disease. And that's the problem. The problem is we can take out the large tumors. The liver will grow back, but it's the microscopic cells that have floated around that may have deposited somewhere that's the problem. Um, and that's where I think the chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting really needs to be evaluated. Because as Juan had mentioned, chemotherapy works better in the microscopic setting than in the macroscopic setting. Um, but it's not gonna work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we really need to focus a lot of the attention and unfortunately for now, the best treatment we have to try to achieve a cure is surgery when the disease is localized. And this is why we harp very much on staging, getting CAT scans and PET scans and MRIs, but only, those are only so good at figuring out is the disease truly localized? And that's the challenge we have ahead of us. Great. Thank you. Actually, I would like to carry on two important points just to go back to the discussion. So for everybody, um, when we are speaking, we please try to look at the big picture. Don't try to look at your particular drug or wait for endorsement, because in all fairness, uh, you know, we always tell the patients that you can have three patients with colonic carcinoma in three rooms in the clinic, but there are actually three different diseases. And when we are in the room with the patient, it's an end of one. It's only focused on that patient, nothing else. And in other words, please don't wait for that kind of, you know, just 
of like, okay, I'm doing well or what have we. Mm. It's a little bit rather big picture. We're looking here at epidemiologic studies at larger picture. But nonetheless, you noticed, and actually Dr. Value showed us beautifully well, like many slides about like how things are evolving. In regard to the pharma as well, uh, your point noted, and we hear this by the way a lot. So this is kind of like the, uh, you know, if I want to call it the conspiracy theory, <laughs> if you want to call it that way. It's not valid. Uh, all of us, by the way, were academicians. We are very shielded from the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we work in a very choreographed manner with the pharmaceutical companies. But we have to admit, we cannot do anything without the pharmaceutical companies. And, uh, you know, we can look at that from every perspective. Uh, there is the pricing, there is the uh, policies, whatever. This is all debate probably a little bit bigger than the, the, the discussion today. But at the end of the day, innovation has been driven a lot by academicians and by drug companies. And uh, we have to really admit that for us to sit here today and talk about all those therapies, if there are no scientists sitting at labs being either in the academic world or in drug companies, wouldn't be there. And I'll tell you one thing, we all cry together. So it's not like anybody has a cure hidden somewhere and like, you know, waiting to make money out of it. Trust me, I'll be buying stocks in this before even you think I'm going to leave medicine, but it doesn't exist. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, good. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. We lost. <laughs> sorry. You've I'm been waiting a long time. I'm a patient patient. Um, <laughs> my name is Matt Reedy, and I'm, uh, I'm a patient. Um, I'm actually taking pebrolizumab. Pebro I call it Keytruda because it's easier um, successfully right now, too. But I have a two or three or four part question. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> the, 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 fir the first is um, clinical trials, accessing clinical trials. Um, I assume it's a, uh, a medical ethical issue, but uh, it seems difficult to get into a trial unless you are highly advanced in your disease state. Is there anything that we can do about that? So can I just quickly pick it as you go along? Sure. Uh, just, just keep the train of thought. So I think it's fair to say that um, th there have been numerous papers in the medical literature to say this is too rare to do clinical trials. And, and so we've used that, we as a, as a medical community and as an MD, uh, you know, we've used this as an, ex as an excuse in the past, too rare, we can't do the trials. Uh, thankfully now we know that's not the case. If you collaborate enough, you can do the studies. And often it means you do a multi-center study. So when we did the ABCO2 study, there were 37 UK centers that were contributing to the study. 43 were open, but not everybody was able to contribute a patient. One of the reasons that we started off in advanced disease is because that's where most patients present. But in fact, as you've heard, adjuvant studies are earlier on. This is when we're going for cure. And so we've now got record numbers of patients taking part in adjuvant <laughs> studies. And whether we can bring that even earlier uh, it, it, and, and get more patients to surgery you know, at an even earlier stage, as I, as I showed on my timeline, you know, that's where we might actually cure more patients and have the biggest impact. So it's still a direction of travel, okay? But I'm, I'm glad to say that we're no longer using that sad excuse of this is too rare. It's not good enough. Okay, thank you. Um, second question is related to clinical trials and the outcomes, the results. Uh, seems impossible to find the results of clinical trials, <coughs> at least from a patient's perspective. Um, and may maybe I don't know how to match it in PubMed or, or scientific journals back to, back to the study, but there seems to be an endless delay or a gap or I don't know what percentage of clinical trials actually publish their results, but it seems very low. Yeah. Is there so, thank any you tips that you have on finding more about the so results? Tips on finding might, might be difficult, but let me just tell you what happens about the publication. I think it is fair to say that there is inevitably a bit of a publication bias. What we mean by that is you're more likely to be able to publish your, your results if they're positive than if they're negative. I think However, the community now has a sense of responsibility to publish all studies, whether they're positive or negative. In the UK, a lot of our clinical trials are um, uh, funded uh, and sponsored by Cancer Research UK. 
one of the conditions of the grant from Cancer Research UK is that you will make the results of your trial positive or negative, accessible, accessible in lay terms that can be understood and they're available through the website. And in fact, uh, I'm looking at Helen here. Helen has helped us in the past, not, not quite at that stage because of getting the results out, uh, but also at the stage where we're working with uh, AMMF in the UK to make sure that we've got the right tone in terms of lay terms, explaining clinical trials, explaining engagement. And in fact, the ABC03 study, which we presented last year at ASCO, it was a negative study. We learned some lessons from it, and that can be clearly seen either through the AMMF website, CR UK website. So there is much more transparency now. I, th I think that's a law in the U.S., yeah. the same kind of thing, but it doesn't, doesn't seem uh, to be I enforced. can pick up on the U.S. a little bit yeah. here. So uh, uh, number one is uh, all trials are registered, and all of you probably, and if you don't know, there's clinicaltrials.gov. This is a government service that actually all trials are there. And you can pretty much actually search by, the search engine is pretty powerful. So you can put even the name of the investigator or the name of the drug or the name of the disease or even if you know a little bit more. And all of them are tagged to a number. And you pretty much can get always the updates from that website enough that even if there was an amendment to that study and they changed the population or what have we, this is all accessible and anybody can access it. This is not driven by any password or even need to sign in. Now, what I agree with you, though, when it comes to publication and knowing what the results are, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, social media and uh, the media in general, if there's something positive, take my word. I'll hear about it in the New York Times before even I read the medical journal, because this is really a great access that's actually high up there. And our national meetings, the media is always there. Uh, but however, when it comes to the patient community and to correlate with the research, I, I can see your point. And uh, it's not like there is a reluctance, but I think the platform is not, uh, how to say, mature enough for that purpose. Remember, physicians are kind of uh, not very versed or comfortable with the social media yet. Not all of us are. Some of us are more than others. And this kind of like will, will probably evolve in a sense where we are more ready to share, not because we don't want to, but just kind of like have that platform somewhere. But there's something to think about even from the foundation. So, no, no news so. is bad news in this case. When it comes to anyway, the outcomes anyway, of the probably time. you okay. have point. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, but we are obligated, same like the UK. This is we cannot sit on even negative work. You know, we are obligated by the NCI to publish as soon as possible, and not to strategically think what we're going to publish. Yeah. Right. Third, and, may, and, and maybe my, my last question, is um, around um, the positive trials, things like proton beam therapy and, and other things. How do we move from those positive results, you know, it's 5% or whatever the threshold is, to, to a point where providers uh, are willing to to uh, give us those treatments, and insurance companies are willing to pay for them. You know, uh, insurance won't pay for proton beam therapy. Insurance won't pay for Keytruda. Insurance won't pay for uh, my insurance won't pay for for a PET scan for for cholangio. Um, so, so uh, what's the mechanism to to move it from? Yeah, this looks promising. To ah, we're now doing it, and oh, and we'll pay for it. Yeah. Because without that, it does us, uh, unless we've got sure. millions of dollars in our pockets, it does us no good. So Hassan may be able to answer for the US, I can answer for uh, the UK. But just before I answer that, if we think about proton beam therapy, it's likely that the control of the disease is going to be as good as you would get with normal radiotherapy or conventional radiotherapy. The trade-off that you're getting is hopefully reduced toxicities. So it, it's not like you've suddenly got a treatment that's so much better. It's another step in the right direction. I think in the UK, as you know, we have a, a, a socialized health economy, and there's always a judgment call, and somebody has to make a judgment call on, you know, do we um, vaccinate um, people with for HPV to prevent cervical cancer? Do we uh, vaccinate the elderly for the flu jab, or do we pay for proton beam? Uh, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult uh, decision to make, and in the UK, as you, you may have heard, Nice uh, makes that decision uh, for us, uh, and obviously they do that with the input from the MDs like myself. No, that's totally right. If anything, uh, 
things are a little bit different here. I want to call it not better, but definitely we have more flexibility than the NHS and uh, the UK system. Uh, nonetheless, um, you know, the system is very clear as it is. Perfect or not is not the point, but uh, if it's something is FDA approved and if it uh, already has a certain level of evidence, Medicare will pick it up and it will be reimbursed. Now, clinical trials uh, by the uh, rules and regulation of the government, the drug that we are adding being tested experimentally will usually be covered, uh, except sometimes if it's already in the market using f used for a certain purpose, even for the same disease, but in different combination, it might be required. And testing on clinical trials probably will also be required to be paid by insurance or by the provider or by the patient. And the reason is, at least in like in a very um, uh, high level note, is we, the government is very concerned about enticement. We cannot kind of entice a patient to get on a clinical trial. Clinical trial really should be driven by the patient, not by the physician. It's a very, very important notation here. This is, uh, we stand strongly by it. Mm -hmm. We made it very clear to patients when we're sitting with them, any of us, is that it's your free will. You can change your mind any minute. We are not really forcing you. Even when you sign, it's not an agreement. You are not contracting. You're simply acknowledging the discussion. This is what we call consenting. So that's really where the processes are in regard to clinical trials. As far as testing, no question reimbursement. I know the question about the PET scan. Um, you know, reimbursement issues are quite complex in that, uh, in, that, in that era that we're living in. And sometimes they are justified, others are not. I think if a physician really feels strongly about a certain test, it's very easy for us to kind of, you know, call for what we call peer-to-peer. -peer. We don't like them, uh, the time consuming, uh, the office between uh, the nurses and the physicians are not really very you know, doing them, but if we have to do it, we have to do it. This is like, unfortunately, how insurance companies curb the money and, uh, you know, make sure that we're not just throwing tests where they are not needed. But if there is a really necessary test, usually, I'll tell you, pretty much you can push for it, you'll get it. But if it's not justified, uh, we might be a little bit in a challenge. So that's really kind of a nutshell, not necessarily answering the specifics, but at least give you a sense of the story. So, good. Just, yeah. a, just a quick follow-up, I guess. So that kind of paints the picture of today's landscape and how right. things work, but it'd be great if there, if the foundation or if there could be a, an advocate, a role where, where we could accelerate the, the movement, you know, or, or we had a group of people who, you know, pushed the FDA to do stuff versus waiting for, you know, specific to cholangiocarcinoma. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if it's within the scope, et cetera, et cetera, but, um, Time is precious, as we all know. I, I million percent agree with you. And obviously, you know, again, there will be, Marion, you probably can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but remember, there are processes for the FDA to approve drug fast, especially in cancer. Uh, there's like fast tracks for things. And I have to say, all in all, we are seeing an improvement in that regard. I know we would like it yesterday before today. But Marion, maybe you are, like, uh, you have quite a bit of expertise on that, so. In regards to uh, trial results, um, advocates are on this one, and we will put a lot of pressure on physicians and researchers. Uh, Clinicaltrials.gov request a data release, but it's usually uh, in a form that patients aren't able to, uh, to address, journal clinical, peer reviewed. So we are working on putting some pressure on the government and requiring a patient-friendly version. So we're behind that one, and it will happen probably within the year. The other question was what? Uh, more about like, you know, the processes that people like to see faster process for drug approval and what kind of thing. Well, the good thing is, as we had been mentioned, we have about six or seven clinical trials um, uh, coming to the forefront now in cl uh, with cholangio. A lot of them are molecular targets. But the nice thing about it is that uh, these um, drugs, uh, companies like to look for fast track approval. It saves them millions. So we're seeing uh, more patient involvement at the FDA level now, um, where actually these uh, targets are being discussed. And we're also asking pharmaceutical companies to get in touch with us at early concept design. And I'll be talking about that this morning. So all together, I think there's a much more greater involvement with patient community, industry, academia, 
uh, in, in bringing the drugs faster to, and, and it's just gonna happen soon, and we're seeing an acceleration of it now. Was that it? Uh, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> and I add to this that, uh, b by the way, uh, on the government level, there are patient advocates, there are people who represent you that actually sit on committees, and actually Marion was actually served for quite a while on the committee for the hepatobiliary cancer that I chair for the NCI, and uh, their presence is very critical. They have a say, they have a voice in regard to if we are doing something appropriate, and same time, how can we move it forward? So you have a voice, and this is very important to note that regard. We'll get back to you with the <laughs> line up there. <laughs> I have, I have just one comment, and then, uh, then state a, your then a name. Question. Where are you from? It's nice. Okay, to hear. I'm Andy Macias. I'm from Cleveland. Uh, my, uh, my wife was a uh, was a uh, patient. <clears throat> uh, in terms of insurance, this is relatively good news, at least in our case. Um, when they when our insurance company initially rejected our claim to pay for targeted therapy, uh, we started it and my wife re responded really well to it. Uh, <clears throat> because she responded well, they reversed their decision and wound up paying for it. So that's the good news. It wasn't as fast as we'd like to have had it, but it happened, and I think that's a turning point. So that's, to me, that's positive. Uh, <clears throat> so my, my next thing is my question, and I, I, I wanna provide you a little, little bit of backdrop before I uh, ask the question. Um, I think it's my obligation to publicly credit the foundation for extending my wife's life for a good five to six months. She had, she had cholangio in a really bad way. And <coughs> she probably would have been one of those people on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the graph there. <coughs> Anyways, um, I was tipped off by, by the foundation about genomic profiling, and specifically by Lisa Crane. She's the one that tipped me off on it. And so we, uh, we pursued a, a clinical trial, and it worked marvelously. She was taking BRAF inhibitors, and she had a 50% reduction in her cancer, and uh, she went back to work. Uh, she was driving again. Uh, you almost even kind of forgot she had cancer. She was doing so well. And this was prior to starting the trial, she was almost confined to a wheelchair in, in, in immense pain. Um, so, and I credit all that to the trial that, we, that we, we, uh, we did down in Texas. However, you know, we were told that the, these inhibitors were, were not gonna work forever. Uh, we knew they were, gonna, they were gonna quit work, and we knew, we knew that the, the cancer was gonna build a resistance to the, to, to the treatment. And so we were, we were braced for that. So I already started looking for the next treatment. And what's the next treatment after that? And what's the next clinical trial after that? Because for us, it was all about clinical trials. There was nothing else. So I didn't mind at all going on clinicaltrials.gov and scouring that, that website for whatever I needed to find. I, I didn't mind doing the legwork. I didn't mind making the phone calls. I didn't mind doing any of that. What I did kind of mind was I'm doing that on my own. And with my limited knowledge of Colangio, I'm out there trying to scour find these, to find these um, trials. I could never find a platform or a mechanism or a medical body that could help me develop a strategy so that I could pick out five trials. And so when one, when one stops, well, let's go to the next one. And when that one stops, well, okay, we have Let's go, let's go to the next one. And have, out, have that all lined up to go. I, I can never find that. And I'm wondering, is there a mechanism out there that can help patients and caregivers develop a strategy in terms of clinical trials? Now, kind of, kind, Foundation One kind of does that. Foundation Medicine kind of sort of does that. But that's strictly for targeted therapy. And so few people can do targeted therapy. But as a, as, a, as a community, is there, is there a body out there? Is there some place in existence that can help caregivers and patients develop a strategy, a long-term strategy uh, to utilize and benefit from clinical trials? Thank you very much for sharing that with us. I can see it was difficult for you. Um, 
I, th I think I'm not aware that there is a ready-made platform out there, and, and otherwise I'm sure you would have found it. It sounds like you were very diligent uh, in, in your searches. Um, I think it probably would be something that is done very much through a disease-specific route. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because we talk about cancer as one disease, but it's in fact hundreds, if not thousands, of different diseases at different stages. And so in order for us to be able to be all things to all people, I think that will be very difficult. Uh, so I think it's more likely that that type of platform would be possible through something um, that's more fine-tuned into an, an individual uh, disease. And I don't want to put the charities on, on the hot spot here because they've done already an awful lot, uh, but maybe that's something that we can think about uh, with them in, in the future. The other second thing that you just need to be aware of is most of these studies, particularly ones in early stages of development, so let's call them phase one studies, are in a constant state of flux where they're opening and closing, opening and closing. Uh, you need 24 patients for a phase one study. You might expand to 36, 48, something like that. You can't necessarily plan for eight months' time, six months' time, two years' time, uh, because the portfolio of studies is always changing. And that's changing constantly in all of the academic institutions. So you can see it's actually uh, a state of, of dynamic flow. I think it's to your great credit that you did uh, all that work to actually get to the bottom of it. I think we do need to think as a community, how do we make that uh, easier for patients? So thank you for that comment. My name is Elise, and I'm a caregiver, a very recent caregiver. The diagnosis was given on January 15th. Um, we have an appointment at MD Anderson on Monday, so I leave here Saturday and drive to Houston on Sunday. Um, but in my quest for knowledge, there's two things that came up. One was called insulin potentiation therapy. Are you familiar with that, and does that help any of this? And then today I got a call from the CTRC and San Antonio Medical Center said that he was uh, applicable for, he could do this DKM uh, clinical tr trial, which I think is what everyone's talking about, the cisgen plus M meaning something else. Do you know mm -hmm. about either of those two? So. I'm, what, I, what I'd like to do is to probably have an offline conversation with you. I'm, I'm just a little bit wary about going into that level of detail on an individual kind of consultation. Mm -hmm. So, but just to just to uh, give you the slightly bigger picture, is cisgem since that became a kind of backbone of treatment. Now there are in fact a number of trials, and I'm sure you're going to hear from the, by the next speaker of what can we add in to that combination to make things work better. Remember, the fact that it's a trial means we don't know it's going to make things better. You know, it is about trying to find that out. Um, and sometimes the, the, the trials are early in phase of development, so can we safely add something in? Does it add any more side effects? You know, uh, wh what exactly are we looking at? Um, and if they're a little bit more advanced, so into more of a phase two stage, then we're thinking, can it actually, uh, is there a signal that this is working better than we would expect the chemotherapy to work on its own before you then go into phase three trial, which would be the randomized design. So I think it's absolutely the right thing to look around, have a very honest chat about what is it that the trial would be in terms of extra. It will bring with it extra commitments and things like that as well in terms of visits and scans and things like that. Uh, but I'm very happy to then follow up um, separately. Dr. Hurtado from uh, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Miami. And I have a question regarding the ABC2 trial, which was done in, in the UK and pretty much established the standard of care for colon carcinoma. In your trial, you used, you, it was used 1,000 milligrams per meter square of genzatiobine and 25 milligrams for cisplatin. Especially when you look at the dose of cisplatin, it's a very low dose. Yep. And then when you look at the results, we have the response rate about 19%. When we think in locally advanced patients, we usually try to bridge them do some sort of curative surgery if we can. So I would like to um, know what is your thought okay. regarding this. So uh, this is a question that's often come from, from physicians. So for those of you who are not physicians, um, cisplatin and gemcitabine we know work together. And, and there's a process called additive, where one plus one is two, and there's a process of synergy, where one plus one is three. So you get an enhanced effect from using two drugs together. And cisplatin and gemcitabine do show synergy, so you get an enhanced effect in certain types of cancers, commonly things like lung cancer, bladder cancer. The traditional recipe 
has been to use the gemcitabine once a week, but then use a very big dose of cisplatin. And this is something that we've inherited historically. We know, for example, in testicular cancer, you need to give high doses of platinum treatment in order to get your effect. We reasoned differently when we were setting up the ABCO2 study. So instead of using two drugs together on the one first week and then just the gemcitabine on its own the second week, if they're supposed to work better together and synergize together, always give them together. So it was by design that we then split the cisplatin into uh, 225 doses, which is, uh, in a three-week cycle, 50 milligrams per meter square. So that, that's actually a, a decent dose over a three-week three, three period. So it was very much, if they're supposed to work together and synergize, always give them together. So that was uh, our, our first approach. That has actually subsequently been validated in some in vitro work that actually shows that in, in biliary tract cancer uh, that there is that effect from, from synergy. The other thing that it allowed was that if you give big doses of platinum, that is a full day treatment and it makes you really sick. So you've got uh, lots of fluids because platinum has to be flushed out of your kidneys or you get problems with kidney damage. So instead of having a, a relatively short infusion, you have to be in hospital for about six hours having lots of fluids and flushing the platinum out of your system. The fact that we were giving it both together once a week for two weeks and a week off meant the treatment was done in two hours. So we do not keep patients in hospital for prolonged periods of time. They're, they're having the, the fluids, they're having the, 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 the treatment. It's in and out two hours. And so, so there were those two reasons that we did it. Before the study reported, we were challenged a number of times on, is this the right schedule? I think the fact that the study was positive uh, validated that, and, and we've not changed that approach since then. I think more importantly, the, the second part of your question was, you know, should we be giving more if we want a higher response rate? Um, I think it's not so much about getting more of a response rate. I think it's for us as medical oncologists to go back and look at the scans constantly with our radiology colleagues. And certainly in the UK, one of the difficulties is that once a decision has been made that something is not operable and somebody's receiving palliative chemotherapy, sometimes that re-questioning of has this responded enough to go back to surgery doesn't happen as frequently as it should. And certainly we're pushing for that. Nowadays, where we do mastectomy and things like that, is definitely a fair question because mm -hmm. it can yeah. make a difference. Exactly. Thank you.